Good morning, everyone. We are here for week three of Roses 2021. And this week, we will be talking about tomography. We're going to wait about one or two more minutes for the rest of our attendees to filter in, and then we will go ahead and get started. Okay, I think let's go ahead and get started. So this week, we are gonna be talking about seismic tomography and our presenter for today, or our lecturer for today is Dr. Adebayo Ojo. Um, Dr. Ojo has a PA, is originally from Niger Nigeria. He has a master's and a um, bachelor's degree in engineering physics and applied geophysics from Obafemi Olawolu University in Nigeria. His PhD is in geophysics and seismology from the University of Science and Technology of China. And he currently works as a postdoctor associ postdoctoral associate at Western University in Ontario, Canada. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him for his lecture. As a reminder, we do have the Q&A, so feel free to put questions um, in the Q&A, and I will go ahead and moderate and verbalize those questions, and we'll do our best to get them answered throughout the lecture. Okay. Thank you, Francisca. Uh, I'm sharing my screen. Um, yeah, I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can. Everything looks great. Okay, great. Thanks for the invitation to to take this lecture at the Roses 2021. Uh, I, I'm quite happy to do this because I was a participant last year and it was a time of learning. So today in this unit, we'll be talking about seismic tomography. And my name is Ojo Adebayo, like uh, Francisca Riley said, and and joining me in this in this talk and lab is Chet, uh, who is a graduate student at the University of Victoria. And um, let's dive into it. So, I would uh, seismic tomography is a big topic, it involves a lot of aspect of geophysics. And so, but basically for this talk, I would narrow down to give some brief introduction and talk a little bit more into uh, about seismic tomography in itself and then narrow down to ambient noise tomography. And we we'll would also be taking a lab session on, uh, on imaging with ambient noise tomography. And, and I would also share some discoveries, uh, grand discoveries using seismic tomography, some limitations, uh, and, and we would end it from there. So, uh, the, the first question I have is, have you ever been in a place where you wonder what lies in the subsurface? Uh, I'm from, uh, in my country, in my home country, there, there is uh, some aspect of a country that is endowed with 
um, oil and gas. And usually at the backyard of people, they see sometimes some Oreos, I mean, some shows of oil. And so in that area, a lot of people always want to know what's in there in, in their in the subsurface. Probably they are will be they will be as lucky as their neighbor that you know his land there, there was hardly found on his land and all of that. And so and then generally that that kind of curiosity is 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 something that uh, is is valid because we have a great need to see into the heads. Uh, but there, uh, there are many reasons for this. For example, we we need a lot of natural resources. In, in this, I mean, we need hydrocarbons, we need mineral for all, all the gadgets we're using today. A lot of mineral resources goes into them, and this all of these resources are not located in. They, they are not equally distributed. They are, uh, and they have to be found. And even as important as groundwater. It, you know, sometimes in places like India and like my country also where there is a lot of scarcity of uh, fresh water, people need to look into the subsurface to get ground, uh, to see where there are fresh uh, uh, potable groundwater. And also engineers also want to know what lies in the subsurface they, because they don't want to put a structure or they want to be sure the structure they will put on a particular uh, soil, uh, the soil is able to bear the body. They don't want to build a magnet uh, magnificent uh, uh, structure on a soil that will cave in. And also for ad scientific uh, advancement and curiosity, in fact, here I'm showing so many kind of uh, curiosity of digging into the subsurface. Uh, um, for example, this is uh, a, a, a deep natural cave in, in, in France and also in South Africa, you could see where people have tried to find gold, you know, digging up to 12,000 feet. And we even have this um, special hole drilled in Russia, which is called the Kola well, and drilled up to about 12 kilometers. And, and, and so people, people, and also we have this um, uh, ambitious uh, project being done by the Japanese government where they're drilling very deep into the subsurface through the, in fact, the target is to reach the mantle. And why, we, uh, and, and, and this is important. We need those kind of grant routes and, every, uh, and all, but what's the problem with this? You know, the, it, when you drill a point, it's point source information, which means, you can only get information about that column of wood that you're drilling. And because there's lateral variation in subsurface properties. So what you're seeing at that point may not necessarily be what obtains in even in the shortest uh, distance from that very point, let's say five kilometers, even for example, in basement complex, if you're looking for groundwater, you could have that change in, in subsurface in, in even hundreds of meters. So, and, and also there's, the, you're limited at the, at, at the depth that you can reach. You know, much of the things we do in seismology, we want to image deep down into the core, into the mantle, which is thousands of kilometers deep into the subsurface. And also it's expensive. For example, this Kola, uh, Kola well took almost 19 years of drilling to, to reach about 12 kilometers. And so that is expensive, it's limited, and, and, and the information is just lean. Uh, you don't have enough information for so many things that you want to. So what's, what's, so what's the solution? And that's why geophysics is you know, really something everybody is embracing because in, uh, in geophysics, what we do is we remotely sense uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 subsurface, and we can through we, we put stations on the on the subsurface, and we send sources into this uh, uh, into the subsurface, and that that uh, uh, energy uh, goes into the subsurface. They are they are in, they re interact and then come back and being recorded in the surface, and when we do that, we are able to then take our data set and 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 process them and be able to re retrieve uh, models of of the subsurface that. Uh, I mean, physical property distribution in the subsurface that we can then interpret in terms of what lies in the subsurface. So, generally in geophysics and, and in, size, in, in seismic uh, method of geophysics, we, 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 we're looking for seismic velocity contrast or what we call slowness in the subsurface. So, if the head was uh, uniform, we would have our rays coming back as straight lines, but because uh, the head is anisotopic, layered, and all of that, and so we will have. Uh, we have our rays coming back, you know, 
uh, in, uh, tracking different parts of, of shortest and trying to bypass slow velocities and all of that. So for example, rays that passes through these slow velocity anomalies are, arrive at the, at, at the station much, much later than, than rays that does not pass through a very slow region. And, and using that uh, uh, subsurface uh, property contrast, uh, we are able to 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 then uh, build a a two D slice of a three D uh, e, uh, subsurface uh, 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 object. I mean, I mean a, the two D image of the subsurface. This process of turning the data that these stations record into depth slice, or let's say even period slice uh, at different frequencies of what lies in, 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 the, in the property distribution in the subsurface is what we call seismic tomography. When, you, when you're observing the variation in velocities at different 2D slices into the uh, 3D, at, uh, uh, into, the three, uh, into the subsurface, then you're doing what uh, we term seismic tomography. Why is it important? Uh, why, and why is it so commonly used these days? Uh, it, it's, it's one of the potent tools that we have as seismologists, uh, and uh, that a whole lot of reasons have uh, contribute to why this method is uh, is so common these days. There is advancements in instrumentation over the years. Uh, now we have even you, you could see this very small uh, piece of uh, seismometers. Even we now we now have geophones, very small easily deployable equipment. And also we have um, increasing stations, temporary deployments all over, all over different places. And so, because we have all of these more and more stations and also very good thing in, in, in seismology specifically, we have big data management services like IRIS. So you don't even need to bother sometimes about acquiring data. You just need to retrieve them and use them. And also we have a whole lot of computational advancement that has provided us the, the computational power to, to do a lot of inversion work and, and waveform computing and all of that. And so also we have a lot of Methodologically, uh, methodological development in recent years that have made this uh, contributed a lot to this uh, method and make make it something that uh, continues to provide the kind of uh, information that we have of the subsurface. So, if you go into the literature, you would see that there are a whole lot of nomenclature around this topic. Uh, and I, I just wanted to start by showing you this image, for example. Uh, when we send signals into the subsurface, or let's say in this case, if an earthquake happened in the subsurface and it's recorded on a seismogram, what we have is a series of, uh, is, a, is a seismogram that contains so many faces. And when we say faces, these are just, if, we see, if an earthquake happens at this point, there are many, there will be a direct uh, P wave that will go straight from the station to the re receiver. There will be other uh, um, rays that are refracted and reflected off at different depths into the subsurface that will also arrive at this station. And so your seismogram contains so many faces and amplitudes. And, and, and so basically when people do seismic tomography work, one of the things they do is to maybe peculiarly focused on picking the arrival time of one specific, uh, uh, I mean, what's it called? One specific phase. For example, uh, we have what we call the P wave tomography or the S wave tomography. In this case, people are picking the first arrival of only the P wave and discarding all other information that the seismogram may contain. And also, if they do S wave, they're only picking the S wave uh, arrival times. And so they, they, in those kind of models are, are good. Uh, they've helped us advance our knowledge of the subsurface, but they are limited, like, like you see here. For this, for body wave um, a tomography method, they have good resolutions at, at depth, uh, but uh, because the rate travels almost near vertical in the near surface, so you have poorer, uh, poor resolution in, in the shallow part of your model. And also it's, it's simple. I mean, we're using ray theory here. It, and, and the uh, computational requirement is not that that much, and and and, and also, but one one issue with this kind uh, with this method, especially when you want to pick S wave, is that S wave is always contaminated with uh, this uh, colder wave that comes after the the P wave, and so more often than not, you would not be able to pick a whole lot of uh, uh, clearly pick arrivals of S wave, and also even if you do. 
you would have very low quality, uh, most likely have very low quality as we've uh, peaked. And, and also we, we we could also have, we also have tomography called a classifier as a surface wave tomography. And here it, they, they are going to discard all of these faces and only going to use surface wave. And surface wave are uh, rays that propagate along the, the, the near surface of the head, like you see in this figure, and then are, arrive at, at, at the station. And, and because, because of that, they, 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 they can resolve very uh, clearly the shallow part of your model and, and also large scale features. But of course, they, they, because they don't propagate very deep into the subsurface, they would, have not, they would not have very good resolution at depth. And, 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 and all of that. So you, and we also have a series generation of models where we have combination, people do join inversion of both body wave and surface wave just to take advantage of the complementary sensitivity of these data sets to one another. And then, you know, build a model that uh, it's much more robust. But in recent um, uh, generations of model, we have what we call a full wave tomography. And in the full wave tomography, rather than just pick uh, each of these seismic faces, why not use all of the information? And, and that's now, in this case, we're using all of the amplitude and face information of all these arrivals that we can find in our seismogram. And, and, and that's gonna provide you a very detailed information about the soft service. Your uh, models are likely to be high resolution, but obviously, as you may think, you need to do a lot of forward calculation of computing the synthetic, and which is very computational uh, comp uh, computationally expensive. So this method is being used nowadays if you have access to high performance computing resources and all of that. And also you, you we have another nomenclature around this uh, seismic tomography uh, uh, study. I mean, uh, uh, study where people term their model based on the, on the seismic source. Which uh, the uh, which they use uh, the seismic source of the data set they are using. For example, you see terms like earthquake local tomo uh, local tomography. It's just telling you about the earthquake is referring to the source of the data set. And then we have what we call the ambient noise tomography, which is pointing to the fact that you know this model was built from data from noise data. And also, and basically this kind of nomenclature is emphasizing the different frequency range. For example, this, 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 this plot just shows you the frequency range of different uh, of these uh, seismic phases. And you could see that we have surface wave, which is much, much longer period and body waves, which is much more uh, higher, frequent, uh, higher frequencies. Also, we, we, if, you, if you look at the literature again, we have uh, what we call uh, a whole lot of tomography being named according to their scales. You could do seismic tomography at different scale, but we, we have local scale studies. For example, if you, for example, this I've, I've plotted here the distributions of seismic stations global, globally and earthquake data in IRIS database uh, from 1992 till date and, and magnitude five event. And you could see that peculiarly in some areas, you have a lot of stations and also you have a lot of earthquake data. In those kind of small scale locations, you, you, where you have the source and the receiver in the same, um, uh, in the same study, in the same region, you could do what we call the local earthquake tomography. And, and in that kind, and most like uh, this kind of deployment are often done where we have very, in seismic, scally active regions, uh, maybe places near um, the, the, the plate boundaries or places where there's active rifting or active tectonics taking place in, the, in those regions. And also in recent time, we have small scale deployment with the advent of new type of tomography method. We have small scale develop, uh, deployment. For example, I show you a small scale of array of 32 stations here that was just deployed for about two years. And, and, and we will be using data from, from this deployment in, in our lab later on. And this kind of studies are much more targeting small scale features and they are much more uh, targeting cluster structures. I mean, structures in the near uh, less than 50 kilometers range of depth in, of investigation. We also have global or regional scale tomography. This kind of work, which I'm showing a, an example from, from this author, is a global scale kind of study. You could imagine it's going to use 
all of the stations available, all of the all of the earthquake, all of the sometimes even all of the ambient noise that you can find, and it's it's a it, they're going to use big data set, and and so you have this very nice uh, tomography showing you the, the 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 variation of velocities across the globe, and and in this kind of study, the emphasis is on last scale last scale features and not the small scale features like you could see you could see very good agreement in where you have high velocity in different continents uh, and but all of these small scale structures are gone uh, and so and, and and i just wanted to point our attention that where iris has an et model where they've collected a whole lot of kind category uh, different types of model ranging from small scale to large scale body wave surface wave. there's a lot of models that are there for if in case you need a model to do your work you could just look through the iris EM, emc and see if there's a good model in your study area already and so i i just need to also uh do a little bit, uh, uh, talk a little bit about in, uh, geophysical inversion here because seismic tomography is actually an inversion, uh, is, is an inversion process because you have data sets and you want to go from your data to distribution of seismic velocity in the subsurface and you want to build a model from that. So that seismic tomography work involves a whole lot of aspects from deployment of stations, getting the data set. And when you get that, you've got, you, you need to do a lot of processing. And a major part of that processing is what we call the uh, uh, tomographic inversion. Or, uh, and, and there are different approaches that people have used in literature to, to achieve this. For example, there is a simple travel time rate theory approach where, for example, this is an example where that can, I can just quickly demonstrate that, for example, you have a few uh, stations at different locations, and then you divide your stations into match, uh, which is, you know, mo most often just equal cell sizes across the study region, and and then um, and then you 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 have ray path crisscrossing the study area at different at different region, and then you set up an inversion. Uh, uh, inversion uh, uh, process where for for every, for each part of uh, for example if you take this first ray that goes from here from here it crosses the cells three so in, in your uh, g matrix you have a value for this for the uh, for in g1 it crosses g1 so you have a value in g2 it, it does, this particular ray does not cross this G2, so it turns to zero. And place and in G3, we G13, we have a ray. This ray is crossing through this cell, so that it has a value in 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 that particular place. In that particular place, and for G4, you the ray is not crossing. So you 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 have this very large matrix that you build from your depending on the scale of the study, and then you need to then invert the uh, this matrix. And uh, and uh, and basically, they, they are very uh, simple, uh, clear approach or workflow that you can follow to do geophysical inversion. Basically, you have your feed data already. If you very much, sometimes we don't have error estimates, uh, but we generally have an idea of what uh, percentage errors have been from literature that you can apply to your data set. Or there are also methods to estimate error for your velocity observations. And also, you must have ability to do forward modeling in this case. And in this case, you want to solve the forward problem. In this case, we are using the ray theory. We're just making some uh, fi infinite as assumption on the sensitivity of our ray paths uh, as, uh, as, as it travels from the source to receiver. And you, you're incorporating any form of power knowledge that you have. And this is very important. And, and like I said, uh, once all of this is set, you're discretizing the head into different matches. You know, you could use regular grid size, like, like I showed here. You could use very noise cells and then scale uh, the matches to be denser where you have very dense ray path and to be more space, uh, more, more uh, uh, spacious where you don't have a lot of ray path. And you, you could, you know, there are many approaches to discretizing your model. And then you choose a suitable misfit you know, most likely we, we go by the uh, least square approach, which is the L2 norm, and which just measure the difference between your uh, your data set and your and your forward modeling. 
and then and then you 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 also design a modern norm because uh, much more in for geophysical inversion you don't just want to fit the data set you also want to put some constraint that you know on the model because uh, this geophysical data uh, inversion is non unique you will have different models that would provide a good fit to your data set and how do you determine what a model that is good that is plausible you have to then put a, a design a modern norm where you incorporate some constraint on on your model and then you perform the inversion you evaluate the result if it's not good then you go back to changing uh probably your discretization your uh, misfit your modern norm and then you you uh, continue that process of iteration until you have a preferred model and this this is one approach and, and like you see if you design an objective function where you have uh, where you insist that you want to feed the data to a reasonable extent and you also want to incorporate a priori information then for example for a priori information we generally know that velocity increases with depth so you, that, that can be a constraint you are imposing on your inversion. You could, from previous study, know the range of velocity you know, that is acceptable, that is reasonable for your, for your study area. For example, if you have sediment, you know, OK, at this depth range, the, the, the velocity will be low. You could give a range of value that's putting some bounds on the range of uh, velocities at different depths. You could, you could also importantly you you also want to have an initial model and for your initial model you're looking at a mo uh, you, you maybe usually we may just take the average value of your data set if you don't have a prior constraint and you use that to build an initial model if you do that then you want a model that does that does not go further uh, further away from that initial model very you know in a wide manner and you want also very smooth uh, model and smooth model in this way Put, uh, give you an uh, uh, acceptable fit to your data set and also they, they, they emphasize you know the, the main features or uh, at least not so many complex uh, structural information in your model for the enough for interpretation and, and if you do that then you have this trade-off between how much uh, contribution is the data fit uh, going to contribute how much is your model norm going to contribute and that's uh, what we call the regularization parameter and and it's always tricky to put that and but one of the methods you could use is to then do a series of inversion where you can check your, your uh, plot your data misfit against your modern norm and then try to plot an L curve it does not always work but sometimes in most cases it could work at least given a, a range of acceptable model around the the elbow of the L curve and and, and this is one way you could do Geophysical inversion. I think the the met you, you we would have been um, practicing a method that follows this scheme, and also there are many other types of uh, approaches to geophysical inversion when you're doing seismic tomography. You could have the uh, a, a situation where you we are not assuming a straight ray. I mean, you are putting a constraint on the the sensitivity of a ray pad as it moves from one uh, the station to the receiver. This is. Yeah, particularly important for at longer periods where you have to put then uh, then people have this in a, a, another kind of theory what, what they call the finite frequency theory where they try to use a 1D or the 3D model to compute the sensitivity kernel of of your of your ray part and also there's this uh, approach where you you could decide to not do it inversion itself um, but do a thousands of, of, of forward modeling, you are exhaustively searching the model, the parameter space. And while you're doing that, you're then using statistical method to then see uh, which model is probable or not. And, and that's the Bayesian approach. And also there is, you know, another much more advanced method, which is called the Android method, and which is very similar to waveform modeling. Uh, you, you, you just using all of the waveform and you're computing synthetic waveforms and then fitting the waveforms to each other. And as you're doing fitting the waveform, you are also updating the, the model starting from an initial model. And, and so all of these approaches are available and, and I, I to, to tomographic inversion. Also, I would move on uh, and to, a, to a one specific type of seismic tomography, which is 
were much, much recently developed. And when I say recently now, it's more than a de decade now. Where, and it's called the ambient noise tomography method. And, and, and this method is particularly interesting to me. Uh, and I, I just want to run through a little bit about uh, the, the, the method and and, uh, and what it entails. So for example, if you take a particular seismic station, like, uh, like, like it's been done here, and then plot all of the data sets, for example, for a whole year of record. One thing that will stand out to you is that very you have, if you compare the, the ratio of the earthquake data set that you have, which are this very uh, high amplitude signal that you have in this plot, compared to the uh, brown background, which is the ambient noise, you would see that you have a whole lot of uh, uh, ambient noise data available, but very few earthquake data. And so, that, uh, and so I think this kind of uh, plot uh, must have at least uh, encouraged some researchers to find a way that of making use of what we classically call noise and try to delete from our data to see if it can be used to image the subsurface. And they became very successful at that. And they found out that if we take, if we assume an isotopic distribution of noise sources, and we place two receivers uh, at a, a, in the midst of uh, a noise source that is uh, uniform across across them, and uh, they found out that if we uh, it cross correlate the data set recorded, if we if we place an impulse source here and we propagate it towards the next uh, to, to 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 the other station, that if we cross correlate all of the uh, the data set over a long period of time, that we will be approximating. Uh, what we call the Green's function, which is uh, the green function basically is the seismogram recorded at one point due to an impulse uh, apl uh, applied an, uh, at another source. And so th that opened up uh, a whole new field of study, which means, for example, if, if you take the cross correlation between station one and two, you will be actually approximating the green function, which gives you, which is very dominated by surface waves. And then because you can get surface, you can retrieve surface waves through this method that opens another uh, feed entirely of developing subsurface model. And, 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 and that's what is called basically, that's the, the, uh, that's the background to the ambient noise method. But of course, this assumption is not always true, which means that sometimes you have um, uh, I, an isotopic noise distribution, and what what when you have that, for example, if the noise source is more dominant in the in the in the uh, yeah, eastern side, uh, of the western side in this figure, and then in the the, the the station two is located where the noise source is not very uh, is not as 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 much as the uh, station one. Then what you have when you do the cross correlation is that you have uh, very more pronounced amplitude. In the in the uh, in the positive lag compared to the the negative lag, and also if you you have the opposite direct uh, opposite situation where you have much more noise coming from the eastern uh, eastern direction to the west, then you have uh, a situation where you have much more larger amplitude in, in the in the recorded at station one of surface wave than the, in station two. So, but generally, when we do this kind of processing, which we will look at, we just assume that the same information is contained in both the, in all directions and then average the, the, the cross correlation out and then, and then move on from there. Yeah, so there is this classic uh, uh, standardization paper that came out, I mean, that was published in 2007 about how to correctly process the uh, uh, data from the raw data to, to Building a model with uh, seismic tomography, um, ambient noise, in ambient noise tom tomography, and I, and I think if you really want to, if you're really interested in this method, this paper is a must read. And so basically, you start from raw data set and you do your preliminary uh, seismic uh, data processing. Uh, basically, you remove the mean, you remove uh, you remove the instrument response. If if your uh, deployment does not uh, is not or if the if the instrument is not the same across the deployment is is uh, you must remove the instrument response and then you perform band pass filtering and and because you're going to deal with a lot of data set like you see it's a uh, and so to reduce the computational uh, weight uh, you could then cut your data into smaller pieces 
uh, some uh, sometimes even up to hourly 30 minutes and then and then apply subsequent processing that makes your processing fast for example this is an example of a waveform recorded at a station and the first thing you want to do is to get rid of all forms of uh, after you just after you perform the initial uh, removal of instrument response and all basic seismological processing you want to remove any earthquake signal from from this data set and that's what uh, and every, any form of station irregularity you want to remove them and, and that's what we call the time domain normalization. There are many methods to do this. If you check this paper, there are about four or five methods, but there's one common method that people use, and that's simple, what, what we call the one bit normalization. And basically in this method, we just turn all of the amplitude uh, depending on their polarity to either a positive one or negative one. And so you have a data with a consistent amplitude. And what happens here is that you lose the amplitude information here. But because we don't actually use the amplitude information, there are methods that are much uh, that also approach, uh, also incorporate amplitude information later uh, in some um, further development. But usually, we just lose the amplitude information and rely on the face and travel time uh, face information. And so, uh, even if you do that, if you take a Fourier spectrum uh, or, or of of the of the data set, you would see that the 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 the, uh, the noise spectrum is not uniform in ambient noise. If I, if you do that, you will notice some very peak uh, some uh, major peaks uh, were, were at 15 seconds and 7.5 seconds, which we call the um, primary and secondary microsims, and at longer periods, which uh, you will notice a peak at about. Uh, at were greater than 50 seconds, which we call the at, uh, the at home uh, signal, and and to do, and then you then need to correct your data. So you 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 would do you apply the spectral whitening to broaden the frequency uh, the, the to 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 broaden the frequency spectrum out. And when you do apply that, then you have a signal that looks like like uh, that is well uh, broadening in frequency spectrum uh, like this. And also this also helps you take care of uh, what we call the uh, in some cases, uh, people have also a, a branch of ambient noise uh, study is to study the noise sources of where these noise are coming from. And so we have in, in the head, we have some very persistent mono, uh, monochromatic noise sources. And one of them is located in a, has been identified to be located in the Gulf of Kinney. And it's uh, the noise sources is dominant at about 26 seconds. You need to remove those kind of signal. Uh, also, and and if you do um, uh, spectral whitening and all of that, it removes uh, all of this signal. Like you see, after the, the data processing, the peak is gone, and you then have a much uh, uniform data set. And so after this, uh, then you 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 then move on to perform uh, what we call the cross correlation of of your of your process data set. And then because you've broken the data set down into a uh, smaller bit, let's say 30 minutes, or you you and you perform cross correlation. Uh, usually, we would perform cross correlation uh, in a one in a day long seismograph. Uh, seismogram. If you do that over a period of time, then you you for each uh, station, then you for for you to produce a one uh, interstation. Uh, noise uh, correlation uh, function between interstation, then you have to do what, uh, what we call stacking. You have to stack all of the cross correlation that you perform. And this is a process to enhance the signal to noise ratio. And when you do that, you would see that as you increase the number of data set that you include in the stacking, you, you then be able to very well define your surface level, become more defined and more clearer. And it's, it's been shown that with more data set, your your cross correlation would have much more, uh, much more uh, uh, signal to noise ratio is 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 improved. Uh, and so this this is an example of cross correlation uh, for my uh, for a study I did during my PhD. And you could see that uh, we we could retrieve very clear surface waves on the on the vertical and radial component, and on the traverse component you could have love wave. Uh, and and so we, the, the, all of these are things you will run through uh, 
uh, during the lab session. So I'm just providing some background there. And so one, one thing we want to take advantage of is that surface waves are dispersive. And what is uh, and that means their velocity depends on frequency. And for example, if you filter the noise correlation function, you would see that at longer period, the, the surface wave arrives faster than at shorter period. And, and that's because and that's because your your uh, velocity increases with depth, and so ray, uh, at longer period, which samples uh, greater, uh, greater depth, your your uh, what's it called? Your seismic rays travel faster and they arrive faster at the station. And then after you do that, then you you we apply some time frequency analysis, and you will and at narrow band frequent at narrow band period, and then you could be you will be able to pick the uh, maximum. Uh, amplitude of your of your uh, of your signal and then get the speed of 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 the seismic of the surface with either group velocity or phase velocity and then you could then map that um, uh, uh, var uh, uh, variation velocity variation with period to depth using uh, well, uh, the de uh, sensitivity kernel depth sensitivity kernel I would I would just leave that because you you would have a hands-on practical uh, uh, in the interest of time. And so we say seismic tomography is one of the potent tools that we have in, in seismology. That's not just a cliche. Uh, we've been able to uh, achieve much more with this method. For example, th this is a schematic of the plate tectonic system. Uh, and as seismologists, uh, one of the things we want to understand is what is happening deep into the earth based as in we have a lot of surface expression of what is happening deep into the earth and we want to understand them like where we have subduction zones we have all of these uh, volcanic chains we have all of these mountain chains and volcanic hotspots we, we really want to understand them and then this is one of the way uh, areas where seismic tomography has proved it, its worth for example i just want to show two uh, be, uh, main discoveries, El, you know, early on discoveries using this method, and that's what we call the shear velocity provinces. Uh, the first uh, series of uh, seismic tomography, which is, has now been improved, and now we have more clearer image of of, di of the deep uh, deep earth. We uh, there, there are very prominent anomalies that was found in the subsurface, and that's what we call the the, the uh, very the large low shear velocity provinces. And they are just two. One is beneath Africa, and one is beneath the Pacific region. And and these are very large. Uh, well, what's it called? Very region, uh, large regions expand to like a thousand kilometers of very slow velocities that has, has been identified. And in, in the very in the lower most mantle, um, uh, mostly probably uh, sitting on the and, and also we we they've identified regions of also ultra low velocities provinces sitting right uh, on top of the of the core mantle boundary. In fact, this looks like a plate sitting on the core on the surface of the core, just like we have different plates sitting on the surface of the earth right now. And so a, a, lot, a lot of effort has been devoted to understand these features in the subsurface. And people are beginning to look, think probably uh, the, uh, the, the regions of high velocity between these large velocity provinces as regions where we have a whole lot of slab you know, being uh, being uh, subducted into in, in, and and then uh, uh, subducted down and then settled deep into the uh, into the into the uh, lowermost crust. And for this low velocity region, they've been thinking. Uh, uh, one of the hypotheses that have been put forward is probably this is this is an accumulation of subducted oceanic slab. We know oceanic slab are always much uh, much uh, probably slower. In, uh, in co compare the, uh, compared to the continental crust. And, and so probably over the Earth's history, you know, there have been a lot of uh, accumulation of subducted sort of oceanic slab. This is one possible hypothesis. And also that there is this idea that this, this could be a, a mantle plume uh, because the, the, we know the core is very hot. And then this might be some molten uh, lower most uh, ma uh, mantle material just uh, uh, upwelling from, from, from the surface of the, or, uh, in the lower crust. And also that there's this very um, unbelievable assumption that the, this could be the, the fragment of the, the, uh, the planetary body called Tezia. I mean, 
tears that collided with with the with the earth uh, and then formed the 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 moon and then probably where this collision take place probably this uh, man uh, this material sink down into the core mantle boundary of the head and but the the, the most uh, prominent uh, understanding or consensus right now is that these are thermochemical mantle plumes that are rising from the from the soft, uh, from deep uh, in the lower crust, and 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 these have been much more verified because, for example, in the in the surface of the uh, in the in the continental regions, places very far from the um, uh, plate uh, plate boundaries, where you don't expect to have uh, uh, what's it called uh, vo uh, volcanic activities. We see a number of them, a whole lot of them in in in, in different places. For example, the Yellowstone in the middle of the U.S. Con uh, in the, the U.S. plate. Uh, I mean, the North American plate. We see the uh, we see that region in in the Alpha region in the African plate. Uh, and so we and one of the thing ground discovery that people uh, that have been found using seismic tomography is that this uh, low la la large low uh, seismic velocity provinces are quite connected to to some of the surface expression of those hotspots. For example, the, the Yellowstone here, there is this rising slow velocities right from the core mantle boundary. In, in Africa, in East Africa, you have that also in, 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 uh, in pit camp. So yeah, so we now have a, a form of consensus right now, at least right now, uh, not, not, not there, there are still arguments about this, yeah, but with improved uh, new models like this model, we now can see that there is very continuous uh, uh, slow velocity rising from the core mantle boundary and having expression in all of these locations, helping us to explain uh, uh, volcanic activities in the middle of the continent where you would not expect uh, such uh, activities normally. Unlike the unwind volcanic chain where you have a hot spot and a plate has been moving around at different times, yeah, we, without that, that's a simple uh, hot spot that could be explained by plate tectonic, but this kind of hot spot are, are, are now being explained by their connection to the deep, large blue velocity provinces. One of another discovery that may interest you as, as uh, our time is fast spent is the fact that we, 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 we know from plate tectonic that uh, we have different plates on the surface of the earth and they grind, uh, they are moving at uh, in geologic time scale, uh, uh, sometimes they are colliding against each other. Sometimes they are just moving past each other uh, at different uh, boundaries. And and at these boundaries where they are colliding, the the denser plate will subduct beneath the uh, the, uh, the the the, the uh, 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 for example the oceanic plate will subduct beneath the continental plate because it's 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 much uh, much uh, dense and, and all of that. So and when you have that, uh, we now with seismic tomography we can image what has happened in the past. For example, in the middle in the mid in the middle uh, North American continent in the US, it's now been found that there is a, a very deep what we call the Farallon slab that has subducted very deep into the in, in the middle of, of the US continent. We also have that kind of uh, images all around in different subduction zones. For example, this is where the Nacta uh, pl uh, plate, oceanic plate, is subducting beneath South, Amer uh, South America, the Andes, and you could see the plate it, because the plate is much more uh, 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 denser, colder. It would show us very high velocity. Uh, and, and then compared to the surrounding region, like I said, in geophysics, we, we, we're dealing with uh, property contrast between our target feature and the host. And so in this case, uh, uh, they will show us very high velocities and we can know the locations of this slab that are sometimes tracking along the mantle transition zone between 4, 4, uh, uh, 440 and 610 or even much deeper into, into, to, in, into the uh, uh, into the subsurface. We see also this in Japan Trench. You could see the very fast velocity slab, which has gone very deep into the sub into the interior of the earth. We see this also be between the Indian and the uh, and Australia, where we see all of this very fast. This is uh, some of very grand discovery about the earth that uh, we've been able to do because we we because of this method. And so I, I would be ending this talk by saying there are limitations. There are limitations that we, we if we intend to go from very uh, non very, uh, from, from mood, our understanding that is not very detailed to very fine scale 
understanding of the subsurface, we have no choice. We need data. We need high quality data, and 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 there's no there's no way you could develop a very good model without data. And I'm going to show this model, and this this shows the region of Africa, and uh, and the kind of model we've been we we, we that's been uh, developed over years. As you had more data, you could see as the data has been added, we have more earthquake happening. We have more stations around in and around, in Africa and around Africa. And with more and more data set, you could see how the model is being improved. So if you see a tomography map today, it could look very different tomorrow because what you see today is just a reflection of the call, I mean, the quantity of data set that we have. And by if we have more data set over the next couple of years, more earthquake data, more, no, um, more noise data, you could, you, you could you at least go down to very fine detail structure of, 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 of the of the subsurface. And also we don't have a control on where an earthquake occurs and that's uncontrollable for us. For example, so many times you want to image a location, you need very many bounce points of, of earthquake in that region. And if you're imaging very deep uh, into the subsurface, probably ambient noise might not help you that much. You need to you rely on earthquake data and you don't have a control of where the earthquake and the frequency of those earthquakes. And also we need more stations. You know, we the, the, the seismic network is growing obviously, but in different locations, there, it is still very sparse and non-uniform. For example, in African region, we have very a lot of stations along the the East African region where Africa is currently splitting around this region, where Africa is splitting into Nubia and Somalia and plates, but all of the other parts of the continent is, is not covered with stations. And because we don't have a lot of seismicity, we are unable to develop very high resolution models. And for example, also to image and answer pending questions about the large velocity, pro, uh, large low velocity provinces, you need stations in the oceanic region. It could be difficult because these are very, uh, these are terrains that you will need high level of technology to deploy stations and have them work. And also tomographic solutions are non-unique. You know, we have data errors. We have uh, each author are, are choosing the damping and smoothing parameters based on their own preferences. And so you could have the same model from the same area and, you know, showing very distant features. And this leads to a lot of argument, a lot of debate. In the, in the seismological community where people are trying to then uh, ask the question which model is more correct, which there's no uniform way of, pro of building these models. Some are, we're using different data set, we're using different uh, constraints on our model. So there, there remains a lot of unresolvable uncertainty using this method and many models, there's lack of agreement in some cases. And also we, we currently the best, uh, um, uh, modeling, full waveform modeling that I talked about that could give you very detailed images of the subsurface are very uh, time, I mean, computationally uh, expensive. And so probably we're looking at advancement in methodology where probably there's a way a new method can be developed where you don't probably need to do that much uh, computation or probably things just get better in, in terms of computational resources that we can now even do much better simulations. And, and, and so all of this causes some forms of limitations um, on the kind of model that, that we can retrieve. So at this point, I just want to say thank you to the organizing committee of ROSIS. Uh, the, 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 the team has done very great things and to the sponsors and supporters. And, and Francisca uh, told me that we have participant in different locations of the world. And I think I'm, I'm quite seated somewhere here. And so without every, everyone on this team, Rossi's would not be there. So thanks for making it possible. And these are some references. And I would say thank you. And if you have any questions and comments, please, uh, please let me know. And we can be contacted at, at this address. Thank you. Awesome, thank you so much. That was such a great overview of tomography. Let's give it maybe just a minute and see if we have any trick questions trickle in. It looks like there was one question for you. And the question is, what type of 
data typically results from field observations? Um, are these arrival times of various phases or are you using some other sort of data? Oh, okay, great. So I will go back to this to this slide. So what, what, what we have is we have seismograms, you know, like for example, like these seismograms. And this seismogram, uh, like I showed you, probably contains uh, the source information, uh, the contains information about the propagation path, uh, whatever the, the, the ray path encountered on its pathway, on its journey from, this, from the source to the receiver. You have the instrument response, you have ambient noise. And so what you have is this wiggle, which we call seismogram. And then you then have to process this seism uh, seismogram depending on on what you're looking for. So different data processing approaches will then help you retrieve a different da uh, data set of interest. For example, if you want to do P, uh, P wave tomography, then all that you need is to be able to pick for each seismogram, for all each earthquake that happened and recorded by this receiver, you want to pick the, what's it called? You want to pick the first break of this P wave. And one of the methods to do that, you could use uh, travel you, you, because you know the source, you know the distance, you could predict the arrival and then use that to guide where you pick the first time arrival. So if you collect this kind of first break or first uh, time travel time arrival for any of these phases, uh, for each of these, any of these phases, let's say P wave, then you have what we call the station, the source, Station uh, um, latitude, longitude for the source, uh, latitude, longitude for the receiver, and then you have the travel time that you picked, and this is done for for and you have that for many earthquakes. So, combining this kind of data set, a tabular data set, then you could perform tomography in that case. For example, in the other uh, method that I talked about, ambient noise, all that you you need is not even a, uh, all that you need is these surface waves. And so you're going to process this waveform in a way that discard almost all of these phases and then emphasize these uh, surface waves, and which you're going to use for your, uh, for your method. And I, I, I just need to point out that each of these wave, will, because for example, if you look at this uh, uh, ray path, each of these uh, wave, for example, all this SCP, PSP, you could see they travel deeper into the Earth's surface. So if you're looking to uh, if you're interested in the deeper structure, you then would not be, you, you, you may need to use some of these converted and uh, faces in, uh, in the subsurface rather than just this surface wave or some of these direct waves. Yeah. So it depends on your, your goal. I hope that that answers that. Okay. And it looks like we have two other questions. So the first question is, how is the correlation function computed when you have multiple stations? When you have multiple stations. So for example, let me use this. Yeah. So um, basically in this case, we have like, for example, in this study area, we have 32 stations. And so what happens is that you would be able to compute provided all of these stations are deployed and they record data simultaneously. Yeah, you know, there are other ambient noise methods that you could use data set that were recorded at different times. But the traditional one, you could only do cross correlation between stations that were recorded at the same time. Not necessarily the same starting day, but at least there must be an overlap in their recording time. So for example, they, for if you have a number of stations, the maximum ray part, I mean, interstation part that you can have is defined by this formula. And so for each of these stations, you will have, for example, from this station 18, you will have a, a, a path that goes to all of the other 32 stations. For each of the stations, you have a path that goes to all other stations in, in the array. And so then in that case, you could then measure, you, you could then measure the, the, the uh, uh, surface waves for each of these paths for each of this part. And you could see here for this 32 station, I have almost 492 uh, interstation uh, uh, noise correlation function, which I've plotted there. 
So it, it, it's one by one, but you just have to pair all of the stations together. Okay, yeah. great. And so we have one final question, and that is, can over, oops, with two questions that came in. <laughs> so That's the fine. first is, can overlap stacking improve SNR um, when you're doing cross correlation calculations and stacking? Overlapping stacking. Okay. I would say overlapping the stacking, if I understand that question well, means you want to, for example, stack periodically and then expand the stacking to, to a longer period. If probably I'm not sure if that is what, what uh, is being said. For, but for example, people will do that to stack periodically. And when we do that, basically there are two things we're doing. Is either we want to see the seasonal variation in the noise source. For example, in this case, you, you have a data for one year and you decide to stack three, three months. And then you measure the, 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 you wanted to see the distribution of the noise source, probably in the winter, in the, in the, in the summer and all of that, or probably you're trying to estimate an uncertainty for your measurements. So for example, you stack every three months and then you produce a cross correlation uh, result. And then you, you do the, uh, what's it called? Uh, dispersion analysis. You do that for every three months and then you then take the mean and the average. And in that way you could generate uncertainties. But as regards if stacking in periodical sense and then putting everything together, if it improves the signal to noise ratio, I would not think so directly. But what I, can, what I can say is what people have used that have improved the signal to noise ratio is using different stacking techniques. For example, if you use a linear stacking technique, you would not get very high signal to noise ratio cross correlation as well as if you use nonlinear stacking techniques like the phase weighting, uh, weighted stacking. And, but if you use that, there's the possibility that you may be distorting your waveforms as well. But I think it's been shown that the contribution is very uh, minimal and that you may not, I mean, the, uh, the, the, the in distortion would not introduce any value that is more than the uncertainty of your measurement. So probably that, that, that th those are ways to improve the signal to noise ratio. But I, I'm, I'm not thinking if you do that in different step would would give you oh and, and I, I think I should also mention another thing people do probably this is what the person is asking is when they are doing the cross correlation they they break the data set down into very small for example one one hour and then they have an overlapping window let's say ninety percent overlap fifty percent overlap and such that by the time they reconstruct the to, uh, the final noise correlation function it will look, it will possibly have higher signal to noise ratio than if you just use maybe uh, the old data set in itself. And, and this is how, if you see recently, we have small scale development, deployment, like one month, like two weeks, I mean, like let's say one month, no that deployment. And, and for that kind of short period deployment, they have to do this kind of overlapping and of the cross correlation to retrieve very high, uh, uh, and uh, noise to correlation function. Yeah. Okay, so we have one final question and then I think let's take a quick break. The question is, um, would you please give, please give some more information about the dispersion curve tomography? Is, it done, is the inversion done independently for different frequencies that correspond to different velocities at different depths? Yeah, okay, let me, yeah. So there are two approaches. In it, traditionally, what, what, is, what is done is that for all of these ray paths that you have, you take, you collate them to the same period. For example, for all of these ray paths, you take all of the five second period and group it together. You take all of the 10 period data, you group it together, at, you know, according to the interval that you want. And then you do a tomographic map you know, a distribution or at each period, at each frequency, like the person is suggesting. And then at the end of the day, that's a two-step approach because then you have distribution of velocities, but at different frequencies. Then you need to then do a, third, a second step 
which is 1D inversion at different grid points to build a 3D model. But in recent times, there are methods that could go from your dispersion measurement to directly to 3D model. And, you know, and we call that direct surface wave tomography. You know, they, you just need to give the code your dispersion data set and you could directly invert to, to, a, a, to structures at different depths and not necessarily at each frequency because that has been taken care of in the code. But essentially, that's the, that's the workflow. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. I think let's do a five minute break and then we will reconvene and start going through our lab exercise. Okay, thanks. So I'm gonna put a five minute timer, timer up and we will um, all reconvene once that timer ends.
Okay, so oops, let's go ahead and get started with our lab section for today. Yeah, thank you, Francisco. So uh, we would start a lab session now. Um, and when when the idea of this lab session came to me, I mean, when Francisca asked to prepare a lab session, um, it, it seems a very challenging thing because we we, we have an idea to present uh, to to have a full scale seismic tomography workflow done implemented, and 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 so but. We, I'm, I'm so glad that we are able to do that and that you would have hands on to if you are to to walk through a notebook where you could go from the very raw data to at least produce a 2D map of the subsurface and a, a case study uh, will be will be presented we've included some data set that you could also play around with in the region of Cameroon, an interesting region where you have uh, a non, uh, an, uh, an enigmatic volcanic system that a whole lot of study has been devoted to to understand. And so for this session, I hope uh, I will be introducing Chet, would be anchoring this session. Um, and Chet is part, uh, particularly skillful uh, in, in this, in this, is uh, is done in a bachelor's degree, uh, I mean project, in ambient uh, in topics related to ambient noise and we've worked a little bit closely together at the geological survey of canada and and it's prepared this uh, very awesome notebook and it will be you know going through it uh he's, he's a graduate student at the university of victoria in 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 canada and i would invite chad please take it away from here um, just give me one second and I'll, I'll put up the notebook here. All right, uh, hopefully everyone can see that now. Um, so yeah, as, as Ojo said, we'll be going through the uh, ambient seismic noise to... Oh. Sorry, uh, could someone confirm that the uh, people can see the notebook? I can see oh. your notebook. Okay, great, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll be going through the ambient noise tomography workflow. Uh, the first step will be extracting some greens functions from ambient noise. Uh, and then the next step will be measuring the dispersion curve from this extracted greens function. And then we will take the previously used uh, data set from Cameroon to do a 2D tomographic inversion. And then we'll finish with a synthetic test for this inversion. Um, I guess uh, I can answer Madison's question if you should like. Um, the uh, so it requires so much data because, uh, as Ojo mentioned in the presentation, the signal to noise ratio increases as the amount of time increases. Uh, so in order to actually get the um, uh, a good signal to noise ratio, we have to use uh, large amounts of data to actually extract the greens functions. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll get started here. We'll start off with just importing these functions. Um, yeah, if you need to look into them a little bit more, uh, they're all open source uh, and you should be able to find them. Um, I'm just going to say that uh, the code used here has not been extensively tested. Uh, so if you'd like to use some of it for your own research, I recommend uh, critically analyzing the code and then performing your own tests. Um, so yeah, here we'll start off with the extraction of the greens functions from ambient noise. Uh, this is based on a, a pre-existing notebook uh, created by Dr. Ching Ching Zhang. And the, um, that was part of the noise pi code, um, which uh, there's a, a paper to reference which I'll show later. Uh, here is a cell, I've just have it commented out for now uh, because this is just to download the data um and then it, this uh cell also removes the trend in mean and removes the instrument response and fills any gaps and it also down samples the data from 40 hertz to 3 hertz um in this case to to save time i, I i've already preload downloaded the data and that will be in the roses directory um 
But if you'd like to use your own stations, you can uncomment this and select your, your code. Here, we're using two stations from the transportable array, uh, K62A and K63A. And yeah, and here we've only used five days of data, which is, is pretty short. Um, so in the next cell, we're going to set up all the parameters that we need to actually do the cross correlation. Uh, in this case, we'll be breaking the time series into 30 minute chunks. Um, and then we're going to slide each chunk by 15 minutes. So there's a 50% overlap between each chunk. This is similar to uh, Welch's method, if you're familiar with that from the estimation of spectra. Um, and in this case, we'll be doing both frequency and time domain normalization. The time domain normalization will be one bit normalization, as Ojo mentioned in the presentation. Uh, and this means that only the, the sign of the signal is reported. Uh, and this reduces the effect of signals such as earthquakes. And then in order to uh, smooth the source spectrum, we'll be using a running mean average. Um, and this is to get rid of those uh, peaks that we, we see in the uh, spectrum. And we'll also be using the data band pass from 0 0.25 to 1 hertz, uh, because this is the frequency range that we'll be interested in. And we'll save cross correlations with a lag of up to 200 seconds. Um, this is, is probably a little excessive for this data set, but um, it, there is no real harm to keeping longer legs other than increased amounts of storage. Uh, and we'll also remove any signals that are greater than 10 times the standard deviation of the normalized and filtered signal. <clears throat> Run that. Okay, so here is where we actually load in the data. Um, here we're using uh, what's known as an ASDF data set, which can be accessed with the PI ASDF module. Um, this is just kind of a, a convenient way of storing and, and loading cross correlation data. Um, so we'll go ahead and run this. So yeah, I should mention that the cross correlation is, is done in the frequency domain. It's it's more computationally efficient and it works better for this processing scheme. Um, but yeah, that's that's all it takes to do the cross correlation there, uh, and some of the basic processing. Now here, we'll just run the cell. Um, so what we do is we actually convert the original time series that's been pre-processed from the frequency domain back into the time domain, and we plot it here. Uh, so we can see that any large uh, transient signals have been removed, and this looks essentially like uh, uh, random noise, which is, is what we are hoping for here. Um, note that the, the amplitude is, is changed from, it's not, it doesn't go from one to minus one, and this is because the smoothing of the source spectrum. Um, and here we'll plot the amplitude spectrum. Um, so that again, it's, it seems like we're, the, the energy is well distributed at each frequency, which is again, what we were hoping for. And then, so we'll do the cross correlation in here we can see the cross correlation function uh, we can see like the the surface waves starting to develop uh, at around uh, negative 25 seconds lag um, now if we had an isotropic distribution of, of sources then we would expect to see um, a more symmet symmetrical cross correlation function but in this case uh, the the array or the two stations are kind of aligned uh, perpendicular to the coastline. Uh, so we'd expect one of the, um, most of the noise is actually coming from the coast. So we'd expect the, the cross correlation function to be somewhat asymmetrical. So uh, a question to pose to all the listeners is, uh, what are some things you think we could do to actually help improve this cross correlation function? Yeah. So now we'll move on to measuring the dispersion curves from this cross correlation function. Um, so the way we'll do this, uh, it's slightly unconventional. Um, what we'll do is we'll make a frequency time image using the wavelet transform. And, and then we'll convert this uh, into a velocity period image uh, just by multi, uh, 
using some multiplications. Uh, in this case, we'll be using what's known as the symmetrical component of the cross correlation function, and that means we'll be taking the average of the both positive and negative legs. Um, and then we'll actually be producing the velocity period image. So I'll go ahead and run this. Doesn't take, it's pretty quick. Um, and we'll also use the noise to pipe functionality to help uh, pick the dispersion curve. So we can see that there's this nice peak that generally increases with increase in period. Um, it's, it's not a, a very clean dispersion curve. There's a lot of noise, um, but we can see that it actually has developed and it does seem reasonable. Uh, note that I have this black line plotted here, which is where the, um, the interstation distance is less than three times the language wavelength. Uh, and this is important because uh, some of the assumptions we use require that the interstation distance is, is greater than um, three times the wavelength. Uh, there's been some research to show that you can actually go a bit lower than that, but uh, in, in Benson et al. 2007, they generally recommend three times the wavelength. Um, yeah, I see that uh, Madison has a question here. Um, so I think the, uh, the maximum allowable leg, uh, it can be really as long as you want, um, but only useful information will be extracted for roughly the, I guess, um, the, uh, sorry, the, the distance, the interstation distance divided by the velocity you expect to see, um, because that, that'll be like, all the um, surface wave arrivals will be within that time window. Um, but really, you can extend the leg as, as long as you want. Although you should note that um, the further you extend the leg, the less the signals overlap when you're actually computing the cross correlation. Uh, so I think anything less than about 75% um, overlap is usually unreliable. Um, but in this case, because we're using a half hour window that's longer than we'd, we'd ever need. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, now that you have a rough idea of how the process works, uh, I'd invite you to try and make a dispersion curve between two stations of your own choosing. Uh, you might need to use a slightly longer data set um, and with, with more data, and it, it may take some time to actually download the data, but uh, it should be doable within a few minutes. Okay, so now we'll move on to the next step of ambient noise tomography, uh, which is making a 2D map of surface wave velocities. So here we'll, we'll assume um, that we, we've made all the measurements of the dispersion curves and we have a measurement at each period of interest. Um, in this case, we'll be using, we'll be uh, investigating one period. Um, so yeah, I'll be using uh, a code called seismic noise tomography, um, which is uh, imported from PySysmo, um, created by Dr. Bruno Gotorbs. Um and I, yeah, I've, I've just modified some of the examples here uh, to make it easy to understand. And we'll be using, uh, as I mentioned before, data from Cameroon. This is from Ojo's uh, PhD thesis. And it corresponds to a seismic array of 32 stations deployed near Cameroon. The files were or organized by period and contain group velocity measurements for many interstation paths at the specified period. Uh, and here I've I've added column names. Uh, hopefully these make sense. Um, it should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, so the first step here is just to load in the data and select which type. Here we'll be working with phase velocity. Um, and we'll remove any measurements that are outside three times the standard deviation of the velocity data set. Uh, and this is just to remove any possibly uh, erroneous measurements. Uh, there may be more sophisticated ways to do this, but this is a simple and easy way to do it. And 
it works for, for this example. So it takes just a second to load in. And then here we'll set up the inversion grid. In this case, it's a regular grid uh, with um, a step size of 0 0.25 and 0 0.25 degrees in both latitude and longitude. And we'll create a small buffer around the grid uh, just to ensure that none of the ray paths actually fall outside. Uh, and this is pretty quick. So here we can say we have, uh, oops. Yeah, so we have 28 nodes in the longitude direction and 37 nodes in the latitude direction. Um, and this is, is, is really not too many. Uh, here, um, the code I'm using makes the assumption of uh, straight ray tomography or straight ray paths or along the great circle arc. Uh, so this is the, the ray theory uh, parameterization. And here we'll just calculate the paths um, where we have at least one point on the path for every kilometer up to a minimum of 100 points. So that's pretty quick. And here we'll actually plot the station geometry. Um, here we can see all the ray paths and all the stations. So we can see kind of uh, towards the, the south of the array, we have the most dense ray paths and they have good coverage from all directions. And now we'll actually start thinking about the inversion. Uh, essentially, uh, as Ojo mentioned, we have this equation, D equals GM, which is a matrix equation. D is our data. Uh, G is kind of like the weights. In this case, it's the uh, integration of slowness along the path. And M is our model. So ideally, we'd just be able to invert G and multiply with D to get M. However, this it isn't always as simple. Uh, in, in many cases, G can be singular or maybe too large to invert. Uh, so more sophisticated approaches will be often be required with some sort of not normalization terms. So in this scheme, G is an M by N matrix where M is the number of ray paths and N is the total number of nodes in the grid. Uh, as I said before, the value of G represents the integration of slowness through each grid node. Uh, for each ray path, the weights in G will be non-zero for the nodes that the ray samples, while the weights in G will be zero if the ray path does not sample them. Um, in this case, this leads to a very sparse matrix, which means there's a lot of zeros. So what we'll do here is uh, we'll take all the phase velocity measurements at uh, one period. I believe that's we'll be working with a period of 10 seconds. That's what the 10 dot dat means. And we'll calculate the average phase velocity, and we'll use that to form our initial model. And here we'll also make the, the G matrix using this uh, utility function. And I, I've included the, the rows utils code uh, if you want to look into how that actually works. Again, that's just modified from seismic noise tomography. Um, and here we'll, we'll uh, set up the Ob observed data, which is uh, represented just as, as variations from this uh, mean velocity. And we'll also calculate the path density through each node in, in the grid. The, uh, this inversion parameter or uh, this inversion scheme actually depends on the path density to uh, help uh, weight the inversion. Uh, and it, we also have to estimate the covariance matrix. Um, here, I'm just going to say that the, the uh, I guess the error in the measurements is three times the, the standard deviation of the measurements. Uh, this is an overly simplistic view and ideally you'd be able to make empirical estimates in the measurement of your phase velocity curves. But um, unfortunately that's, uh, or this way is a bit simpler and better for the demonstration. So I'll go ahead and run that. Okay. Oh, so what is the dispersion curve telling you? Uh, essentially, the dispersion curve is the velocity or, um, as a function of period. 
Uh, and as Ojo said before, as uh, longer period waves tend to sample deeper into the earth. So, uh, and deeper into the earth tends to be faster. Um, so longer period measurements or um, waves tend to arrive first. And basically by analyzing the dispersion, we can actually kind of work out the subsurface uh, properties. Uh, hopefully that answers your question. Feel, please feel free to elaborate if it doesn't. Okay, so here we'll uh, plot the ray path density. Um, here, just the number of paths is the color. So we can see in some spots we have as many as 40 paths. But in a lot of the grid, we actually have no paths, uh, which means that there's no sampling there. Um, and we notice that it kind of follows the ray path coverage. Uh, and it's also important to note that the direction of ray paths is important. Um, ideally, we have uh, many ray paths crossing in different directions. Um, but if all the ray paths are traveling in the same direction, there'll be uh, strong smearing in the direction of the ray. <clears throat> okay, so in this next cell, we'll actually set up the inversion parameters. Um, this step usually involves uh, a lot of trial and error, uh, and a lot of parameters will work. Um, and there, there are methods that can be used to help find these parameters, but generally this is uh, one of the more difficult parts of the seismic tomography workflow. Um, so essentially the, the correlation length is, um, or is also known as the, the smoothing width is used to help weight the inversion. Uh, and it is also, um, uh, works together with the path density to help weight the different areas. Um, and then we also have a smoothing parameter alpha and we have, uh, what's known as the strength of the penalization term, uh, or it can also be known as the, the damping term, which essentially controls how far the, the uh, final model strays from the original model. Uh, here, we've just set that to one. And we also have this value lambda, which essentially is like uh, controls the sharpness of the ray path density. And that's used to weight the inversion. Generally, this is 0 0.15 or 0 0.3 or some small number like that. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and the cell will also perform the matrix algebra down, down at the bottom here to actually do the inversion. Uh, because we have a small data set, it should run pretty quickly. Um, okay, so we have a question here. Are the configuration files x dot dot only dependent on the geometry of stations? No other parameters are involved. Um, well, so at, at each period, there, there'll be different measurements that pass our quality control criteria. Um, so e each file is gonna have slightly different data um, and each, each file only contains information for one period. Um, so yeah, um, and it, yeah, it also has in information on the interstation distance. Um, so it really depends on the, the quality of the data, I guess. Um, idea in assuming every measurement was perfect, then e each file would be the exact same size, uh, just with slightly different measurements, depending on the period. Uh, but in this case, especially as period increases, because of that three wavelength criteria that I mentioned earlier, we're going to get less measurements at long periods uh, up to a point. Um, and also there tends to be a lot of noise at short periods. So that will also restrict our measurements at, at short periods. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, so yeah, we've ran this uh, and we've created the velocity matrix. Um, and just for your own convenience, I've, I've wrapped kind of all the previous functions in in a function called uh, invert for model down here. Um, essentially, it does what we've just done with, um, but it's a little more concise. Uh, so here we'll set up, uh, 
we change the correlation length um, to 30 kilometers, um, which I, I think tends to work a little bit better in this case. But yeah, I'll go ahead and, and run this. And it, we also print out the number of measurements that we've removed. So here we can see we've removed 11 measurements. And yeah, I'll go ahead and make the plot here. Some reason it's not showing. Hmm. Give me one second. Oh, that's strange. Hmm. Oh, that's not good. Um. Well. I'll, I'll move on uh, and hopefully I can get that working in, in just a minute. Uh, I'll come back to that. Um, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, okay, uh, I'll move on to the synthetic conversion. Oh, if someone said there's a, an issue, PS convert. Oh, okay. Hmm. I see. Okay, that's good to know. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll just move on to the synthetic conversion here. Um, we use uh, slightly different parameters just to make it work. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and run this. Yeah, and we'll actually go ahead and plot the results. Okay, yeah, that one works. Um, yeah, so these are the results of the synthetic test. Uh, on the right, we have the true model. Uh, and on the left, we actually have the, the, the recovered model. And we can see that, the, and in this case, I, I've masked all the areas uh, that don't have any ray paths traveling through them. And we can see in the center of the array, the checkers are quite well resolved. but um, towards the outside of the array, we see a lot of smearing and the amplitude is not well resolved. Uh, so that's kind of an example of some of the limitations we might have. Um, yeah. Uh, and yeah, uh, I guess uh, a task for everyone to try is to um, try playing around with the synthetic conversion a bit on your own. Uh, an interesting challenge to try is to see how small of the squares or the checkers can be resolved. In this case, the, uh, the check checkers are separated by 100 kilometers. That's what this parameter specifies. But you might be able to go smaller, or you might get better results with larger checkers. And yeah, um, that's the end of the lab. Um, we created uh, 2D maps of surface wave velocities at one period. Um, and I'll come back to the, the real inversion, just to give you a minute. Um, but I'll mention that once we have these 2D period maps or uh, 2D surface wave maps at each period, then the next step is to actually invert for a 3D shear wave velocity model. Uh, so the way this works is um, we'll take uh, a grid node from one geographic location and we'll take this from each period in our surface wave map and we'll make a 1D dispersion curve using this method at what for one specific geographic location. Uh, once we have that, then we can use uh, some other inversion technique to actually invert for a shear wave model. Um, that's uh, a bit more than I'd like to get into today, but I've included a couple codes down here. Uh, that can be used for this purpose. Um, and notice that there's also another data set in the data directory. Uh, this data set contains data for the Georgia Basin in British Columbia. Um, a fun challenge would be to try and get a, a 2D period map working with it from um, using your, your new skills learned from today. Uh, a, a small hint for this is that we should see a low velocity zone in kind of the, the northwest of the study area. 
Um, and that, that's actually what's known as the, the Georgia sedimentary basin. Okay, and here's the references and here's a couple other useful codes that can be used for ambient noise tomography. Um, yeah, if you give me just a, a few minutes, I'll, I'll try and get the actual plotting function to work here. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I think, thanks chat so much for giving an overview of that. I think maybe what we should do is um, you can do some real time troubleshooting and we might end the webinar and just um, migrate over to Slack and we can answer sure. any questions and do some troubleshooting in the Slack channel. Okay, sounds good. Okay, right, so thank you everyone. Thank you so much to our lecturer and our lab teaching assistant and um, we will see you not next week, the week after for our next Roses unit.